Sing hymn number two hundred and one. Two hundred and one. Whoever receiveth the crucified one, whoever believeth on God's only Son, a free and a perfect salvation shall have, for he is abundantly able to save. Let's keep our seats again, two hundred and one. Whoever receiveth the crucified one.
to get everyone to laugh in front of God's returns tonight. Um, we sing together the words of sexy sex, sexy sex. The first verse says, I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, and he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. If it's indeed boy, let's stand and sing together again. Sexy sex. <coughs> I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross on Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story. Oh. 
just as God's blessing on the gospel of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord. Father, we bow before thee and we thank thee that there is one and everyone that comes to thee will never cast them out. We thank thee as a promise from the Lord himself. And we know there have been millions that have chosen to put their all on the Lord Jesus for eternity. And we thank thee no matter where they have come from, no matter what they have done in their lives, no matter how deep uh, into sin they went, how long in religious endeavours they had engaged, we thank thee that any saint, anyone that ever turned to the Lord Jesus and came to him in humility, he received them and will never cast them out. We bless thee that even as we are here tonight, there is a vast number already in heaven. And they have, they trusted him in their lives. We thank thee they have found him faithful in their deaths. And they are waiting uh, in that moment that uh, their bodies will be resurrected and be reunited with their souls. And we thank thee, O oh God, that what we're speaking about in the gospel is reality. And we are we're preaching about one who is able to see it. And we thank thee, his word is steadfast and true. And we just pray that there would be those tonight, maybe feeling the burden of their sin. They would take the promise of the Lord Jesus when he says, Come unto me, all you that labor, and I am heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And they'll come. We know there's no, no way we can uh, come other than in humility. We are coming to the one who is the greatest, the most approved, the most majestic there has ever been. And we just pray that by this pump, whoever opens the word now, give them power of the eyes. And we just pray that those that listen, that they would be one to Christ tonight. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Seventy-six. Seventy-six. I heard the loving message, and now healers say, "Whosoever will may come. Seek now the precious Savior, and He will be yours today. Whosoever will may come." Will we just stand to sing this setting in here? <coughs> that grand word, whosoever.
I'd like to read two short passages uh, from the Word of God this evening. The first is in the Book of Romans and chapter 8. Book of Romans and chapter 8. <coughs> Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I'd like to think of that expression, he that spared not his own son. Uh, we'll read another passage in 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter two I just think of that expression spared not. Second Peter chapter two from verse four For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample or an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And we look to God to bless, again, the public reading of his holy word. I've not been able to get Romans 8 verse 32 out of my mind these past few days. He that spared not his own son, but delivered us, uh, but delivered him up 
for us all. It tells us of the reason why Christ died. It tells us of his sufferings on the cross. And just so that we can get the picture of what it meant that God did not spare his son, I've read 2 Peter 2, which gives us an idea and gives us examples of when God did not spare the people from his judgment. And that's what happened at Calvary. God's own son was not spared from his judgment. But unlike the cases we're going to look at in 2 Peter chapter 2, the Lord Jesus was not punished for his own sin because he had none. In the New Testament, we have a lovely testimony concerning him. He knew no sin. He did no sin. And in him is no sin. But the Lord Jesus took upon himself and willingly bore the judgment of God on the cross against sin. Why? He who spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. It was for us. It was for our guilt. It was for our sin. Taking upon him the judgment, the awful judgment of God against sin, taking that for us. We're going to see that God spared not the angels that sinned. God spared not the old world in the days of Noah. God didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. He did not spare his own son so that we could be spared. Isn't that wonderful mercy? If we look at 2 Peter chapter 2, we'll get an idea of the intensity of God's judgment against sin. Let's look first of all at the example of the angels. We read about the angels or God spared not the angels that sinned. It was Satan at their head. They rebelled against God's authority. They didn't want to be under God's authority. They wanted God in their own terms. They wanted to be in power. They wanted God to be subject to them. And they rebelled and they sinned. Now rebellion against God is a serious thing. Excluding God or subjecting God to our wills and our lives is sin. And it says about the judgment that came upon them, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That's very severe, isn't it? And God is a holy God. And that was the judgment against the angels that sinned. You might say, what's that got to do with us? Well, that word sinned has a familiar ring to it because Romans chapter 3, verse 23, tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The angels sinned, we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God, as a holy God, will judge sin, must judge sin because of his holy character. There's a lovely combination here between the righteousness and holiness of God and the love of God and the grace of God because he spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. And God poured out his judgment against our sin upon his son so that we could be spared so that we could be saved, so that we could freely have, together with Christ, all things. That's how God wants to bless every soul this evening. Doesn't want them to come into judgment. Doesn't want them one day when the day of judgment comes to be without Christ, to be without forgiveness, without salvation, and just to endure forever the judgment of God. That's what happened to the angels that sinned. God spared not the angels that sinned. Let me read in verse 5 in 2 Peter 2. And spared not the old world, the ancient world, in the days of Noah. 
bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Genesis chapter 6 describes for us what those days were like. It says this, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart some competition. <laughs> so God said about the days of Noah that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now if you look at our world in general today you would think that I was describing our day with all that we can see around us and God brought in the flood and destroyed the old world. And there were only eight saved. We're going to think about that in a few moments. But can you see the severity of God's judgment against those angels that had sinned? Against the old world, who refused the only way of salvation. Not only were they guilty because of their sin, but they refused the only way of salvation that God had provided in the ark. Because in the midst of all that, we read that God spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Noah was saved from that judgment. He was a preacher of righteousness. And God saved him. We're going to think about that in a few moments. So God spared not the angels, spared not the old world. And then he refers to Sodom and Gomorrah. A place synonymous with wickedness and sexual immorality. We see God's judgment there, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow. Fire and brimstone rained down from heaven, and those cities were burnt to ashes, and those in them perished. The severity of God's judgment, God didn't spare them. But even in the midst of that, there was one called Just Lot, Righteous Lot, and he was delivered. And we'll think about him in a moment or two. Now the reason I've highlighted this, and the Bible is like that. If you're looking for the explanation of a verse or to understand it, you'll find it somewhere else in the Bible. So when God says he spared not his son, Here's a passage that tells us what it looks like when God does not spare people in judgment. The severity of it, the intensity of it. But when we think of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, though these judgments that we read about in 2 Peter are severe, they're not the same as what the Lord Jesus went through at Calvary. The Apostle Paul says that he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So God did not spare his son. Mind you, his son went willingly. That's why he came into the world. The Father sent the Son into the world to be the Saviour of the world. And the way he could be the Saviour of the world was by going to the cross and being under God's judgment for sin, for our sin. The punishment is due to us for our guilt. And he bore all of that. The prophet Isaiah spoke about that hundreds of years before and he said concerning the Lord Jesus, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brings about our peace was upon him and with his stripes are we healed. The Apostle Peter in his first letter, we read from the second letter, his first letter says this, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So not just the angels, not just the old world, 
not just Sodom and Gomorrah, but the Lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. And all God's holy judgment and righteous judgment against sin was poured out upon his son on the cross. Why? He delivered him up for us all. It was for us. So that by him bearing the judgment and by us accepting what he has done by believing in him and trusting in what he has done at the cross, we can be spared from the judgment of God. We can be saved as Noah was. We can be constituted righteous before God as Lot was. And what a tremendous cost. A friend in the meeting tonight, if God's salvation could have be, could be obtained in any other way, then that way would have been devised, but there was no other way. In the words of that old hymn, there was no other good enough to pay the price for sin. He alone could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in, and that's what it cost. He who spared not his own son. The only one who ever really fully delighted him. The one who was pleasing to him at all times. When he was here on earth, we read about the heavens being opened and the voice of God being heard, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Lord Jesus himself said about his life, I do always the things that please the Father. And God found in his sinless son as man here on earth, one in whom he found delight at all times. One who not only did sin, but he went about continually doing good. Who did his father's will and fulfilled all his pleasure and all his delight. And yet God did not spare him. And it certainly wasn't because of judgment that he deserved. It was judgment that we deserved. And that God would give his son for people like you and me that we would be spared. And he would pour out his judgment on him so that we would have the opportunity to believe in him and take him as our saviour. And that it could be true of us what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 there is now therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And that's the key. Are you in Christ Jesus tonight? Have you received him as your saviour? Have you accepted his death on the cross as the only way of your salvation? Because God's desire is to bless. Because not only did he not spare his own son, but deliver him up for his all, says, how shall he not give us freely together with him all things? Abundant blessings in Christ. There is forgiveness, there is salvation, there is peace with God, there is eternal life, there is deliverance from judgment, there is hope from the, for the future. And every blessing that God would give is in Christ. And God who gave his son to such a death and spared him not, it was so that we could enjoy the abundance of God's salvation and the abundance of his eternal blessings. Uh, would you take him as your saviour this evening? Would you be delivered from the judgment of God in the future? To have the Lord Jesus as the one in the day of judgment who would represent you before God and say, see all those sins that he or she committed? I paid for them all. And they believed in me. That's wonderful, isn't it? And in those days of judgment in the Old Testament that we read about, it says that God saved Noah. Now how did Noah get saved? From the coming judgment. Well, Noah believed God. He put his faith in what God had said and in God's word regarding the way of escape from that judgment. Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that by faith, Noah, being warned of God, built an ark to the saving of his house. By faith, God told him to build the ark and the only way 
to be delivered from the judgment of God that was coming to the flood on the earth was for those who went into the ark. And no, we read it was the eight. There were only eight people. All from Noah's family. Not that Noah didn't preach. He was a preacher of righteousness. But only eight went into the ark. You can hardly believe that. And yet they wouldn't believe the judgment was coming. It had never rained in the earth. They couldn't accept the idea of a flood, but when it came, only eight were saved. And it's just a lovely picture that to be sheltered from God's judgment, God has made one provision, and it's Christ. He's like the ark. And we need to go into that ark. We need to take Christ as our saviour and shelter in him and trust in him and have our sins forgiven and be saved. And while we're still here on earth, we preachers of righteousness and be a witness and testimony for him. What about Lot? If you were to read the life of Lot, it was a bit of a checkered life. Lot wasn't what you would call the ideal Christian. And he's called just Lot. Righteous Lot. This righteous man struggled and was distressed with the sin that he saw and heard around about him every day. Now, how, how can I be called righteous? As the Bible tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us are righteous in ourselves. None of us meet God's standards. But we quoted the verse earlier, he who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God can reckon us righteous. He can count us righteous in his sight when we are in Christ and we have him as our saviour. And his work on the cross is put to our account when we believe in him. But what a tremendous cost. Noah saved, Lot righteous. And there's an opportunity for us to enjoy that position this evening. He who spared not his own son. And what tremendous cost. I could hardly begin to explain sufficiently the intensity and the immensity of the sufferings of Christ for sin. But the price has been paid. His blood was shed. He died and rose again and he's a living saviour. And he was delivered for us all. And God will freely give us together with him all things if we're prepared to trust in him. Would you trust the Lord Jesus Christ tonight? Plead to him for refuge and shelter from the judgment of God and find a full and abundant and eternal salvation in him. May God bless his word. Turn back to the letter to the Romans, Romans in chapter 3 this time, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 21, but now the righteousness of God Without law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And we look to God to bless the public reading of his word. 
What we've heard this evening from our brother David is absolutely fundamental to Christianity. It's absolutely fundamental. If you were to about, I suppose, 150 years ago now, maybe slightly more than that, I need to check my dates, I'll be getting on for 200 years ago. The Rosetta Stone was discovered in Egypt. And when they discovered the Rosetta Stone, they were able to unlock the meaning of the hieroglyphics that were on many of the ancient Egyptian monuments. They discovered a book there, written on the walls of the temples, and it was called the Book of the Dead. And there was illustrations associated with it, and you can find them online if you look for it. But one of those illustrations showed one of the Egyptian gods with a soul who had recently died. And that Egyptian god is standing with a pair of balances. He's got the heart of that individual on one side and a feather on the other. And whether or not that soul went into paradise depended on whether how many good deeds had done versus how many bad deeds had done. And do you know, incredibly, that pagan idea continues down through every one of the world religions, apart from what we've heard tonight. The idea that somehow what I do is going to merit my entry into heaven or my rejection from heaven. That somehow if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, that I will be found accepted in the sight of God. Can I tell you, the Bible has no such idea. No such concept. We've heard tonight that it's so important that there is a righteous basis upon which God can save an individual. And the only righteous basis. You know, all of these religions that say that if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, don't deal with my bad deeds. What does God do about my bad deeds? Does he just close his eyes? Does he shovel them under the carpet? Does he ignore them? A righteous God cannot do that. A holy God cannot do that. He must deal with my sin. He must deal with my bad deeds. But we've just heard tonight, and we've just read about it again, how that God can himself remain just and yet be the justifier, the one who declares righteous men and women like you and I. And what's the basis on which he does it? He does it on the basis that he's dealt with my bad deeds. He's dealt with my sin. He dealt with them in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ when he spared not his own son, but freely delivered them up for us all, that we might, there might be a righteous basis whereby God could come out to us, to men and women, and say, what is the basis on which you can be saved? Simply accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour. You see, in this section that we've read this evening, the Apostle Paul was primarily writing to people who had been brought up in the Jewish religion. And they'd been given the Ten Commandments. And incorrectly, they had got, sort of got the idea that if they kept the Ten Commandments, that they would be accepted before God. And like many who followed that ancient pagan idea of the Egyptians, they sort of ignored the concept of their bad deeds. And they just kind of swept those to one side. And the Apostle Paul writes to them and he says, By the deeds of the law, by the good deeds that you do, shall no one, no flesh, shall be justified in his sight. It's absolutely impossible that anyone will ever stand in heaven and say, I'm here because of the good deeds that I did. It's an absolute impossibility. He says, boasting's completely excluded because it's got nothing to do with what you do. He says, but how is it that you can be found in the sight of God? And I says, he says, but now the righteousness of God without law, so not on the basis of the law at all, the righteousness of God is made manifest, it's revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is what? By faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. That's how you get to heaven. That's how you get right with God. That's how your bad deeds get dealt with. It's by believing that when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, he was taking the place that was mine. 
He was taking the punishment that was mine. He was bearing in his body, as we've heard, his own body on the tree, all my sins, all my iniquity. The prophet Isaiah writing way back, and this is why the Jews were completely misunderstanding their own scriptures, because way back in the prophecy of Isaiah, they would have read that God has made to meet upon him the iniquity of us all. They would have read that there was a Messiah that was coming. One who would die on their account. One who would, who would, who would, who would bear their iniquities. They would have read that all we like sheep, just as we read here, that there is none. In fact, this is a quotation from the Old Testament, that, they, they, that, they, that there is no difference, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And they would have read from the, the prophecy of Isaiah that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The old preachers used to say, we have to come in at the first all and go out at the second all. You, know, you have to accept that all we like sheep have gone astray. And you have to accept that the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We have to accept that we are sinners in the sight of God. And we have to accept that Christ died for sinners. And if he died for sinners, he died for me. And it's the person who believes in that. The person who holds on to that. That is the Christianity of the Bible. That is the Christianity of the Bible. The plain teaching of the word of God. That is through faith alone. It was one of the great statements of the, the reformers. And they, 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 they had five statements around that. But that was one of them. It was through faith alone. Purely on the basis of faith that we can be saved. And it's on the, and by believing that when Christ died upon the cross, he was stepping into the place that was mine in order, as we've heard, that we might be made the very righteousness of God in him. Have you got any concept? I, I don't think we do have a concept. Even those of us who are saved, I don't think we've really got a concept of what it means to be given the righteousness of God. In Christ. You see, we're even those who are saved, we're still prone to sin. We're still prone to doing things that are wrong. And yet, we are found given the very holiness of God, because that's the only standard that God's ever going to allow into heaven. The very holiness of God is granted to us who are sinners. And continue to sin. And yet God, because he has placed all of our iniquities upon Christ, is able to reach out to every one of us and give us the very holiness of God. And that is, a, that is the basis on which we will enter into heaven. Not because we've been cleaned up a bit. Not because we managed to reform our lives and, and make a few changes and make ourselves a bit better. No. But because we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted him for salvation. And on that basis, and that basis alone, God is able to be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. I wonder whether there's somebody in the meeting tonight. You would love to be saved. You'd love to be right with God. But you're still laboring under the misapprehension that's got something to do with you. It's got nothing to do with you at all. It's everything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing that you can do. The only thing that we can do is to believe. It's just to believe. Just to accept that what God says is true and to accept him as our saviour. And if you were to do that, then we heard that I think it was in prayer at the beginning of the meeting that anyone who comes we read that in our verse that all who come everyone who believes can find that righteousness of God that is apart from the works of the law and you can be fitted for God's presence as if you were you can be ready for as ready for heaven now as you ever will be in a future day just on the basis of the finished work of Christ would you not just accept him as your saviour tonight trust him and we the Lord Jesus Christ himself said him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out shall we pray together
Our Father, we would again return thanks for thy word. We return thanks for the simplicity of the gospel message. We return thanks for the greatness of the work that was accomplished at Calvary. We give thee thanks for the basis of salvation. It means that thou can be both just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Our Father, we just ask thy blessing to be upon thy word as we've heard it tonight. We pray that pray there might be no one who would labour on trying to make themselves right with thyself on their own strength. Our God, we know that way is bound to fail. But we just pray that there would be someone who would be simple enough and humble enough to come to thyself in faith and trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their own and their personal saviour. Part us now with thy blessing. Take us home in safety, we ask, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.